Right now, if you would, let's take a second to make some noise for our online audience. Let's welcome everybody that's watching online right now. I want to welcome you to the home of Vision Church. We finally have a home. Welcome home, Vision Church. It's amazing. So, hey, I want to encourage you to do something a little unorthodox. If you have your smartphone right now, go ahead and pull it out. Go into Facebook and share the broadcast right now. The reason that I'm telling you to do that is because with just one share, you have no idea how far the gospel may reach. So I'm going to encourage you to do that now. If you pull out your phone and you share it on Facebook, we won't make a weird face at you. In fact, we encourage you to do that. Share the live stream. Let's be a church that shares. Amen. Can we just not be ashamed of the gospel? Nobody amen that, but that's all right. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, turn with me this morning to Matthew 21. And we're going to begin in verse 13, Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 13. Hey, something really quickly, I just wanted to say, for all of you who were at our revival nights last week, how many of you enjoyed the presence of God last week during the revival nights? It was incredible. So if you're here for the first time, welcome to Vision Church. We've literally been meeting nonstop for like the last eight days. So last Sunday was our first Sunday in this building. It was amazing. And then we met twice that day, and then every single night from then on. So I'm a little bit tired, a little bit weary, but God be strong in my weakness, Jesus take the wheel. Anyway, um, but I'm pleased to tell you, 11 precious people made a bold decision to repent of their sins and surrender their life to Jesus Christ. That's amazing. And I pray that that never, that never gets old. I pray that that never loses its zeal, its awe and wonder. I tell you, if we ever get just accustomed to people giving their life to Jesus and that just kind of rolls off our back like no big deal, we need help, okay? That is a precious thing. That's the greatest miracle of all. Do you know the greatest miracle of all is salvation? Because he could heal your body, he could deliver you, he could do all that stuff, but guess what? You're gonna die anyway, all right? I know that's bad news, off to a bad start. But when he saves your soul, it's an eternal work that even the grave can't stop. Salvation is the greatest miracle of all. And the angels are rejoicing over what God is doing right here on West Boulevard. Listen, this morning, I'm going to bring to you a message that I contemplated bringing to you last Sunday as the first sermon in this building. Uh, but I decided not to. I felt like I needed to preach city on a hill, light in the darkness, which is what I believe this church is and what it will be. But today, I want to talk to you about the six principles of prayer. Now, I know that didn't get any amens, and nobody really gets hyped to hear a sermon about prayer. And the truth is, is that you don't hear sermons about prayer very often. But it's critically important because Jesus said, my house shall be a house of good worship. Oh, oh no, wait, I'm, I misquoted that. My house shall be a house of good preaching. No, no, no. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer. Above all things, he could have called it. He said, my house should be devoted to a house of prayer. And I believe that's what we're going to be, Vision Church. We're going to be a people of prayer, a people of intercession. I just believe that for our house. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 13. And said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. These are the words of Jesus, and as you can tell, he is very seeker-sensitive. Not Like, we get this mentality that Jesus was just, like, soft and just very kind and just very, like, meager and didn't want to offend anybody. Have you read the Bible? Like, Jesus is in there flipping tables, spitting at the, at the Pharisees, calling them a generation of vipers, telling them, you've turned my house into a den of thieves. I love Jesus. He just laid it down. It would do us good to just get a little bit more of that truth. The truth isn't always what makes you feel good, but the truth is the only thing that has the power to set you free. But I want you to pay close attention to the words of Jesus when he said, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Like when we hear that, we think about, you know, selling stuff in the church, and I've heard people be like, you shouldn't sell books, you shouldn't sell coffee, you shouldn't sell t-shirts in the church. All right, I hear you, and that's, not, well, that's a very different sermon. But really, I believe that his words are still resounding true 2,000 years later because still today we've made it a den of thieves. 
And by that I mean we have confused the local church and we've become consumers rather than contributors. We look at church for what it can do for us, how it can bless us, who we can meet, how much respect we can get. We look at church the wrong way. And I'm gonna go ahead and hurt your feelings right now. Church is not about you. Look at your neighbor with a little attitude and tell them, it's not about you. And, and we know that, but, but here's, hear me, and y'all know it's true. People, before they hit the parking lot, they'll be like, well, you know, I just wasn't feeling that worship today. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know the songs, you know what I mean? I didn't even, I didn't put both hands up. I just did like a half hand because like, I wasn't feeling it. The drummer was just a little too loud and, you know, like, I don't know. You really think it's about you, don't you? Did you notice the lyrics? We weren't singing about you. We are singing about him. But, but we've become consumers. We've made his house a den of thieves. Not that we're stealing anything, but we're, we're coming to get. We're coming. We're treating the church like a restaurant. Flavor of the week. What's it going to do for me? I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now. There are going to be Sundays that you walk in here and you don't feel like being here. There are going to be Sundays that we sing songs that you don't know. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are going to be Sundays we sing songs you don't even like. But guess what? We're not singing for you. We're singing for him. He's worthy. He's deserving. He sent his son to die on a rugged cross. And we're here for him. This is all about him. Lord, forgive us for our consumer mindset, thinking that it's all about me, 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 me. No, 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 no. I come to pour out my praise. I come to give back the breath you've given me. I'm here for you to bless your name. And if I get nothing out of it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my best and my worship. But you know, the truth is, is that when you come with that mindset and you come with that perspective that I'm coming for you, I'm coming to bless you, you will be satisfied. You will be filled. He will meet your need. He will bring revelation into your life. But above all things, he said, my house shall be a house of prayer. Not performance, not entertainment, not consumerism, a house of prayer. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Oh, that'll preach right there. We can just set it down, set this down. We had church. To be a Christian without praying is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Prayer is your, it's your lifeline. It is your sustenance. It is your oxygen. It is everything in the walk and life of a believer. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. And over the next few moments this morning, I'm going to go through six principles of prayer. And I truly believe that no matter how long you've been a Christian, whether you've been a Christian for 30 minutes or for 30 years, I believe that this word is going to speak to you. I believe it's gonna build faith up in you and I believe it's gonna affirm some things that maybe you knew true but you had forgotten. I really believe this is a word for right now and I'm gonna tell you at the nine o'clock service, the Lord moved in this place in a powerful way. Matthew chapter six, beginning in verse five. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that's all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself and shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. I'm gonna read verse nine in the King James because... I don't know the Lord's Prayer in any other version but then King James. <laughs> and after this, therefore pray in this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Can we give God praise for that beautiful passage right there. My goodness. These are the words 
of Christ himself as he's teaching his disciples how to pray. Over the next few moments, I'm gonna go over these six points. And the first one is this, don't pray to be seen. Don't pray to be seen. Historically, the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, they were notorious for praying publicly. In fact, they would look for the most highly trafficked street corner, and then they would perch themselves up on it just at the right time to pray these lofty, eloquent prayers so that everyone walking by would go, oh, Wow, look how holy, look how close to God they are. The Pharisees love to be the center of attention. They love to pray openly for the applause of people. In fact, Jesus is showing us that the very motivation of the heart behind their prayers was the applause of men. The Bible says that you can serve only one of two masters. You will love one and hate the other. If you do this Christian walk for the applause of men, if you do it for the respect and the fame and the adoration of those around you, then you are not truly doing it out of a genuine heart for him. Jesus is warning you that when you pray, don't get caught up. Don't let your insecurities drive you to act like a Pharisee where you need validation from people. Don't pray to be seen. Don't look for the public spaces. And I'm going to ask you a question real quick. Do you pray more publicly or privately? You don't have to answer that question. In fact, please don't. All right? I don't want you to embarrass yourself or anybody else. But just like, I want you to think in, inwardly, do I pray more like when people are watching or do I pray more when nobody sees me at all? Jesus says, don't pray like a hypocrite in the public. God's looking at the heart, the motive. Look with me really quickly to Luke 18, 10. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Before I read it, though, I want to show you one more thing. Jesus says, don't pray publicly like a hypocrite because that's the only reward they will ever get. So Jesus is literally saying, the applause of people, the respect of people, that's all you're going to get because I'm not hearing your prayer. Did you catch that? If you pray with the wrong motive, if you pray with the wrong intent, if you pray to be seen, to be respected, to be lifted up, then that is the only answer you're going to get is the applause of people. In other words, Jesus is not going to hear your prayer. He resists the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Luke 18.10. Two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not to even lift his eyes as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. I tell you, this sinner not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I love this example. Jesus tells us that these two men went into the temple to pray together. It says that the Pharisee stood alone by himself. In other words, out in the open for all to see. And he prayed a self-righteous, arrogant prayer. In fact, it sounds much like the religious of today. Oh, thank God I'm not a wicked sinner like that. Oh, thank God I'm not like this poor peasant tax collector over here. Like, thank God I'm not like him. I know none of you have ever thought you're better than anybody else. This sermon's definitely for somebody else, for sure. I pray that God breaks every religious spirit from your life. I pray you never forget how far Jesus reached to save you. I pray you never forget where you came from. I pray that we always are humble at the foot of the cross and it stays fresh in our mind just how lost we were and how undeserving of his salvation we are. The Pharisees trusted in themselves. They trusted in their own righteousness and in their own goodness and they thought that they deserved God's favor. 
They prayed an eloquent prayer, by the way. It was beautiful and majestic, and they looked holy. But Jesus said, you're like a whitewashed tomb. You're beautiful on the outside, but you're full of death and decay on the inside. You live to appease men, but you offend God. And that is, oh my, if there's ever a description of the age in which we live, it's that. In our culture today, everybody's so PC. Oh, I got to be politically correct. I can't offend anybody. We won't offend anybody except God. Yeah. Woo! We want to protect everybody's feelings. We want to coddle everybody's point of view except for God. That's a whole other sermon. But the point here is that the man, the sinner, cheater, tax collector, finds a corner in the temple in humility, doesn't even lift up his eyes to heaven because he knows he's unworthy. He knows he's a sinner. When you stand in the presence of God, you can't help but be reminded of your mistakes and your sin. And he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy, forgive me. Jesus said, one man went home from that temple justified, and the other was the Pharisee. Now, according to men, we would have lifted up the Pharisee and said, look how righteous he is. But he was wicked. It was the one who prayed in secret, the one who pr prayed in humility, the one who recognized how lost and broken he really was. Jesus said something profound. He said, I came for the sick. And the Pharisees heard that, and they were like, oh. Came for the sick. Well, that's clearly not us. The truth is, we're all sick. Just not everybody knows it. We're all stricken with a chronic disease called sin that is a cancer of the soul. We're all sick. Just not every one of you knows it. I pray you know it today. I pray you become like this tax collector and you humble yourself and you say, Jesus, I need you. Aren't you thankful, though, that when you come to him just as you are, he receives you. Aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't say to that tax collector what some churches have said to you? Well, if you don't look, if you don't look like us, then, you know. Churches have said and religion has said, you got to get, get whole, get healed before you come to the hospital. You got to get clean before you take a shower. You got to look right and fit the mold before you belong in our church. Is that connecting with you? Is that making sense? Churches have said, well, you don't, you don't fit in with us. You don't look like it. You don't, I mean, you're too messy. Jesus said, come to me just as you are. All you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus accepts you just the way you are, even when he does not agree with you. But aren't you thankful that he loves you too much to leave you that way? He accepts you the way you are and he transforms you into his image. This first point, I'm still on the first point. Don't pray to be seen. Some of y'all are getting nervous, but you will beat the Baptist to the steakhouse. I promise you will do it. <laughs> well, maybe not if I keep going at this rate. Anyway, another, another side note here on don't pray to be seen. Eloquence does not equal effectiveness. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that tell me they're like, Pastor T., now, you know I would pray over the, over the blessing at Chili's, but you know I'm not good at praying. You know, I would pray at the volunteer huddle, you know, before church, but you haven't heard me pray. I'm not good at praying. Don't you let me hear you say that. If you tell me that you're not good at praying, I will call you up here right now. I will put this microphone right up in your face, and you will pray today. You're going to pray today. Some of you can bear witness that I have done that to you. You're welcome. There's no such thing as being good at praying. That's like saying, well, I'm not good at breathing. Well, of course you are. What you're really saying is, I'm not eloquent. That's what you're really saying. And I'm going to go deeper. And really, that's pride in disguise. Really, what you're saying is, I don't want people to think less of me. Really, what you're saying is, I don't want people to think I'm less holy or less spiritual than I want them to think I am. And that goes right back to the first one. Don't pray to impress men. The, the, the sinner tax collector in the corner of the temple 
Did you read his prayer? It halfway didn't even make sense. It wasn't eloquent. He's beating his chest over in the corner, and he's mur- murmuring out, oh, God, forgive me, have mercy. It was a broken, disheveled, kind of didn't even make sense prayer, but it was from his heart, and that is what pleases the Father. Your eloquence doesn't move heaven. A genuine heart does. Everybody can pray. It doesn't have to be eloquent. God used a man who got tongue-tied, Moses, to deliver a nation. He couldn't even talk plain. But it's the Lord who gave you the gift. It's the Lord who moves on your behalf. Another thing really quickly while I'm here, you don't need to pray in the King James, okay? I promise you God understands plain English. You don't have to pray, thee, thou art heavenly, thou art divine, benevolent. I mean, come on with all that. Just talk to God. Prayer is a conversation between you and the Father. He understands. Your, he knows how you talk at your job, okay? He understands you. It doesn't make you more spiritual, I promise. Second point, remove all distractions. Remove all distractions. Historians believe that In ancient Jewish homes, there was a place inside of nearly every home, even if it was just a corner, that was devoted to prayer. It was devoted to being alone with God. Jesus, when he teaches us how to pray, he doesn't say go to the street corner, get up here on the stage with a microphone. No, he says go go hide away. Go into a, a room and close the door behind you and eliminate distractions. Let me just help you real quick. It is really, really hard to pray. When your iPhone's on, your laptop's on, ESPN Sports Center rolling through the back, it's really hard to pray in that environment. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this world wants your attention. This world is thirsty for your attention. It's thirsty for your focus. Don't give to the world what belongs to Jesus. Give him your focus. Give him your attention and adoration. And when you pray, shut up out all distractions and focus on him. We used to have a church office before we had a building over near Bojangles Coliseum. And like, it would never fail. Like anytime, like I was just working on a random project, like nobody would call the office. Nobody would show up at the office. The second I would start to pray, I mean the second, it would be like, everything's vibrating and shaking and people are calling and ringing the doorbell, it's crazy. The world is vying for your attention. Press through the distractions. Make time for God in your life. And if you seek him, you will surely find him. Can I get a witness of anybody who believes what I'm saying today? You gotta remove all distractions. The truth is we don't like silence. We don't like quiet. I don't. Anybody else, can you be bold enough to say, I don't like silence? Like, silence makes me uncomfortable. Just feel it for a second. You knew it was coming, so it's not as awkward. But if I just didn't tell you. And the longer the silence gets, the more awkward it becomes. And the truth is, is that we pacify our convictions by being overstimulated and distracted because we don't want to face the true condition of our heart. We don't want to face the true conviction of our sin. So we busy ourselves. We occupy our time so that there's no time for us to truly be alone and just reflect on where we are with our creator. But can I tell you that in the quiet is where you'll find him. The Bible says that he has a still, small voice. Elijah looked for the voice of God on the mountain, and it was not in the whirlwind. It was not in the earthquake. His voice was not in the fire, but the Bible said his voice was in the whisper. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. It's hard to hear a still, small voice when you're talking all the time, It's hard to hear a still small voice when you're distracted all the time. I gotta show you something else. There's a reason Jesus says, I want you to go away and be free from distractions because it's in that place that you become vulnerable. And God does his greatest work in your vulnerability. I'm gonna try to preach to you right now. I'm just gonna try to get this through. God does his greatest work in your vulnerability. 
There's a story, real quick, in the Old Testament that you think is weird. You've read it, and you've probably been like, the Bible is weird. But you don't understand what it really means. Moses was called to deliver Israel out of Egypt, out of 400 years of slavery. And God says, I'm going to raise you up. You're going to stand before the most powerful man on earth, Pharaoh. And Moses is like, who, me? What? I, he's not going to listen to me. And God says this. I want you to put your hand in your cloak. I want you to pull it out. And he pulled it out. And his hand was white as snow, stricken with leprosy. And he's like freaked out by this. And so he puts it back in. Then he pulls his hand out and it's clean again. Now, I'll admit, when we read that story, we're like, okay, that was kind of not sure why that got in the Bible. But here's why. The Bible uses imagery. It uses symbolism to communicate timeless truths to you. And what that example is showing you is that God will never heal what you will not reveal. That rhymes too, and it, it makes sense. <laughs> God will never heal what you won't reveal. You know, even like, other like recovery programs have figured this out. Like step one of like every recovery program is admit and be vulnerable with your situation. In other words, if you reveal it, then the healing can begin. There's another story about this. In the gospels, there was a blind man. You remember Jesus healed this blind man and then Jesus said, well, what do you see? And this, this blind man, I tell you, like, I would be his friend. He was bold. He goes, he goes, well, I can kind of see, but, but men, they look like trees. Y'all, have you read that in the Bible? Trust me, it's in there, okay? That's so bad for a preacher to say. Horrible thing for a preacher to say. But you know, there's this story. Jesus says to the blind man, what do you see? And he says, I see men, but they look like trees. We just read that and pass over it. That man was talking to God incarnate. He was talking to his creator in the flesh, the, vis the, the image of the invisible God. And he tells Jesus, you didn't heal me the first time. I know I'm messing with your theology now, but that's what the Bible said. Jesus prayed for the man, and the man goes, well, I can still, I can kind of see, but the men look like trees. Was there something wrong with Jesus' power? Was Jesus like all of a sudden just not able to heal that day? No, no, no. Jesus wanted this man to be vulnerable with him. Jesus wanted this man to be open with him. He wanted this man to be honest before his creator. And when the man said, no, I see men, they look like trees. He was honest. He was vulnerable. He was truthful, bearing all before his creator. He received a second touch. And this time, his sight was restored. He was healed. He could see clearly. And the Lord restored his sight. I'm telling you all that to tell you this. God desires and he demands honesty and transparency from you. And that's when he starts working in your life. Y'all pray these prayers and you try to talk to God like you haven't sinned and like you haven't messed up and like what you did was like justifiable and not really that bad because the person in your other cubicle sins worse than you do. Yo, God, he's seen everything you've done. He heard everything you said and he loves you anyway. But he will not heal what you won't reveal. You gotta be open. You gotta be transparent. You gotta be vulnerable. And you got to be available to let him work in your life. Anybody believe what I'm saying to you today? Can I, can I get a witness of somebody that says, when I'm vulnerable, that's when he works in my life? The third point, don't get nervous. That means we're halfway through. Somebody in the 9 o'clock shouted, hallelujah. I'm just kidding. They, well, maybe they did. Point number three, quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. I love Jesus. When he was teaching us how to pray, he goes, now don't, don't ramble on and on like some people do. Did you read that? It was in the Bible. I just read it to you. Jesus is like, when you pray, you know, don't pray to be seen by men. Oh, yeah. And don't ramble on and on. Like, I heard you the first time. Can we just take a minute to say we love Jesus? Right? He says, don't just ramble on and on, vain repetition to me. I heard you the first time. God is not looking for the quantity of your prayer. He's looking for the quality of it. We think that we can manipulate God into answering our prayers because we prayed for an hour. We think.
think that, well, if I prayed for 45 minutes, man, I'm real holy today. Like, I'm real holy, and now God's going to do this for me because I put in this time. You think that it's performance-based. You're still trying to earn his answer. You're trying to perform and manipulate and twist the arm of God, and you cannot. Prayer is not about how long, how much. It's about the sincerity of your heart. It truly is. There are some denominations that teach vain repetition. <clears throat> the Catholics. Um, <laughs> that, that teach, just welcome to Vision Church. If you haven't been, just welcome. Um, that they teach that you just, you reach God by vain repetition. But I'm going to show you what that looks like. Matt. So I, Matt, we're going to pretend like me and Matt are going to have a friendship here. Friendship. And, um, and I'm just going to talk to you in vain repetition. Let's see how it goes. Hey, bro, how you doing? Hey, bro, how you doing? Hey, bro, how you doing? Do you see, you feel, I know, I know that's cheesy and super lame. But do you feel it? That's how you're trying to talk to God. You say the same thing over and over and over and over again to a living, divine being who wants a relationship with you, but you just keep regurgitating the same thing, excuse me, the same thing over and over and over. He literally says, do not seek me in vain repetition. He wants transparency. He wants authenticity. He wants your heart, not your rituals. He wants your heart. Because you can go through the motions of a ritual. You can even come to this church and go through the motions and your heart be disconnected and it does not please God. You can sit in this church and you can worship with our team and you can just regurgitate the lyrics off the screen, but if it doesn't come from your heart, it's empty. God does not want an empty sacrifice from you. He wants your heart to be connected to your words. He wants you to say what you mean and mean what you say. And in that moment, he will inhabit your praises and move in your life. You know, real quick about quantity over quality over quantity. Do you know that Jesus never gave you an expectation of how often to pray? Now, I hear you. Do y'all that know your Bible say, well, it says to pray without ceasing. You would be right. That also means live with the awareness of God always, constantly. You're eating a number one at Chick-fil-A, and you're aware that God created this heavenly, you know what I mean? Like this heavenly manna. So like wherever you are, I'm connecting it to my God. I'm aware of him always. I am talking to him. I'm communing with him. I'm fellowshipping with him without ceasing. Yes. But when Jesus taught us how to pray in Matthew 6, he did not say what the Muslims say. He did not say you must pray five times a day facing the east and get to a window if you can. He didn't. He didn't say pray three times. You eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you pray breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of you that are like structured, like my wife, you probably wish Jesus had said that. You know what I mean? So you'd be like, I'm checking the box. But me, I'm more like a free spirit. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, because i will be forgetting at breakfast. I'm serious. I'm not a morning person. It's supposed to be a little funny, and you know it was. <laughs> Jesus did not give you any suggested structure on how to pray. You know why? Because he doesn't want your relationship with him to be an obligation. He doesn't want your prayer to be obligatory. He wants it to be voluntary. You're right. He wants you to freely come to him. You know how beautiful it is when a free moral agent like you and I who could live any way we want to live, we could talk any way we want to talk, we could act any type of way we want to act, when we choose to shut out the world, to shut out the distractions, and come and reconcile with our creator, to commune with him, what a beautiful aroma of worship that is from heaven. What a beautiful act of worship that is. You could do anything you want to, say anything you want to, but you choose to pursue your creator creator, your God, your maker. That is beautiful. It's voluntary. It's epic. It's incredible. 
Aren't you thankful that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom? Thank you, Jesus. And can I tell you this? Hungry people eat, thirsty people drink. What I mean by that is if you're hungry for God, you'll, come, you'll pursue him. If you're thirsty for the fountain of living water, you will drink from his word. You will, you will go to the well. And if you're not hungry, and if you're not thirsty for God, I'm going to drop something deep on you. It's because you're full of something else. I'm just going to leave that right there. <laughs> Sex will satisfy for a moment. Alcohol will satisfy for a moment. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But he is the one. He is the fountain that never runs dry. He is the rock of the ages, the water in the wilderness. He is our fountain. He is our source. He is the one. He said in John 4, if you will taste of me, you'll never thirst again. He's the answer. Another thought here, really quickly, is that prayer is a two-way conversation. Now, this is going to be this is going to blow some of your some of y'all's mind. Prayer is two parts: you talk, and then you listen. Mind blown out here, because some of y'all pray like this, and I'll be the first one to admit I've been it. I've done it too. God, I need you to. Blind my boss so he doesn't see me check in late. <clears throat> God, I need you to touch the vet so that that cat bill is a little bit less. God, I need you to touch this person. That per I need you, God, I need you to do this, this. Amen. We spend the whole time praying, listen off everything we want, everything we need, and then we put an amen on the name of it, on the end of it. And then if we're really feeling spiritual, we say, in Jesus' name or in Jesus' mighty name, if you're feeling real good, and then you walk off. And then you go to Chick-fil-A and have your number one. But imagine if you talk to your boyfriend that way, your husband that way, your wife that way. It was just all one-sided. You just do all the talking. Some of you husbands are looking convicted right now. And you do, <laughs> you do all the talking and you never listen. Distance will ensue between you and your spouse. 50% of your prayer life should be you listening. Can I tell you what it looks like for me? When I listen for God, I, I do not hear a loud, audible voice thundering, Tyson. Like I did, this is not what happens. Maybe it happens for you. Some people, I talk to you and you, you hear from God every single day and that is awesome. I'm, I'm so happy for you. For me, it doesn't happen that way. But what does happen when I'm still and when I'm quiet, he recalls his word back into my mind. He recalls scripture that I read last week. He recalls scripture that I read that morning. He recalls scripture that I had read and forgotten, and he brings it right into my memory at just the right time. You say, God doesn't speak to me. He's already spoken. There's 66 books, 40 different authors spending 1,800 years written in three languages and three continents. It's called the Bible. Every time you hold that book, you are holding the word of the living God. And the Bible is not just one book. You're holding a library. It is a miracle in your hand every time you pick it up. And people always want to discredit the Bible. And they're like, well, it was written by men. Well, so was your physics book. And you believe that? And just, I'm going to slide this in on for free. Your physics book is like probably version 17.5 because it keeps getting outdated. But this book is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word remains forever. And I'm just going to say this. I'll be honest with you. When I started the ministry, I, I'm just going to say it. I've already been honest with you everything. I legitimately, as an early pastor, I was scared 
that the more I discovered about the Bible, the more I would find contradictions or discrepancies. I was worried. But can I tell you, after decades of studying his word and being devoted to it, I found the exact opposite to be the truth. I have become more amazed and more astounded and more in awe and more convinced today than ever before in my life that that is the infallible, that is the God-inspired, God-breathed word of the living God. It is a miracle and it is the truth. It is. I'm convinced with everything I have. Here's another commercial. Soon we're going to offer something at this church called School of Discipleship. It's something that we started years ago back when we were in metro school. And it's a five-week course. It will not make you a disciple in five weeks, but it will give you the foundational tools and elements to grow and mature and become, start to become self-sufficient as you study and learn the word. What it will do is it will solidify your faith. It will answer questions that you have and your friends may have about the Bible. It's, it's comprom- how it was canonized and everything. You got to take that. As soon as we offer it, you got to be in there. Sign up for that. It is incredible. We're going to talk to you about why the Bible is the living word of God. I got sidetracked. Point four. I pro- I know it's 12. You're going to be all right. Point four. He already knows the need. He already needs, knows the need. Some people think that when they pray, they're catching God up on everything he missed. Like, I promise you, he knows. You're like, God, well, you know, you know, Karen, you know what she said, you know. I mean, I'm just trying to pray for her, but, you know. Like, he already knows. He already knows. In fact, here's what I mean by this point, is that we expect prayer to transform the world around us. But I believe God intends for prayer to change your heart within you. I think prayer is more about changing you than it is about changing circumstances. Am I saying that God can't move mountains? And I, oh, I believe he can. I've seen him do it. I've seen sick people healed. I've seen people that were addicted set free. I've seen people that are demon possessed. Yes, I said it in church. Set free. I've seen it with my eyes. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe that prayer changes us more than anything else. Prayer aligns you with the heart of God. Prayer aligns you with the things he loves, you begin to love. The things he despises, you begin to despise. It begins to align your heart with his plan, his purpose, and his will. And real quick, while I'm here on this part about he already knows the need, you need to remember who you're talking to, who you're praying to. And and I'm just going to teach you this real quick. We don't pray like Talladega Nights and Ricky Bobby all right, like six pounds, seven ounce, whatever. Like, we don't pray to Jesus. I know this is going to shock you. The Bible doesn't teach you to pray to Jesus. Jesus taught you to pray to the Father. You say, where's that in the Bible? I just read it. Matthew 6, the most famous prayer in the Bible, our Father who art in heaven. You ever heard of that? (laughs) We address the Father in the name of Jesus. This is important. Because there was a very high price paid for you to pray to the Father and him hear you. In fact, Jesus Christ climbed up on a rugged cross. Nails were pierced through his hands and feet. The image of the invisible God took on your sin and mine. He bled out on the cross not just to save your soul and wash your sins away, but to make access to the Father. It was through his sacrifice that we now can come boldly before the throne of grace in our time of need. Do you realize that as Christ hung on the cross, the temple in Jerusalem was shaken and the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the people was ripped top to bottom because, and here we, not bottom to the top because man could have maybe done that. Top to bottom, God himself ripped it open. God himself made a way forever declaring, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to the Father. There is now a way. Jesus said, no one will have access to the Father but by me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus said, I am the door. He is the way to the Father. The cross was not just about your salvation. It was about your reconciliation to God the Father. 
people of Jewish descent 4,000 years ago would have given anything to have the access you and I take for granted today. They could only look at the temple from a distance. But now through Christ, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. You can approach the Father, the architect of the universe, the one who created heaven and earth. Thank you, Jesus. A high price was paid for your access. Point five, I'm going to hit this one just really quickly. God's will is not always done. Jesus taught in the Lord's Prayer, pray, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would he teach us to pray that if God's will was always done? Really fast, I, as an early Christian, fell subject to a, a lie and a deception, and I believed that God's will was always done. So I actually experienced prayerless months, prayerless years almost, of me just saying, well, there's no real point in me praying because God's going to do his thing. He's gonna, his will's going to be done with or without me. Wrong. God could do it without you, but he chooses to do it through you. You say, well, I, I don't believe that. God's will is always done. All right, I'm going to diffuse that argument in three seconds. The Bible says it's God's will that all should be saved and none would perish. Are all saved? Are all going to heaven? So therefore, God's will is not always done. Pray his will in Charlotte. Pray his will in your life. Pray his will in your family. And the more you sink into his word, the more you'll understand his will. And prayer transforms your will to align with his. It's a whole other sermon, a whole other topic. Don't have time for that right now. But pray that his will would be done on earth. Last point, as the band comes to help me close. God's answers are often overlooked. God's answers are often overlooked. Look at your neighbor and tell them, don't miss it. Don't miss it. I'm going to say something bold, if I haven't already. I believe that every prayer is answered. It just may not be the answer you were looking for. 1 Kings chapter 17, another strange Old Testament story that brings life-giving truth and revelation to today. There was a widow in the village of Zarephath, weird sounding name, I know, but there was a severe famine in 1 Kings 17. It had not rained in a very, very long time. And there was a widow in Zarephath with a son and she had just enough flour, just enough oil to make one last meal. And then she and her son were going to die. The Bible doesn't tell us specifically in 1 Kings 17 that the widow prayed, but it doesn't have to because she was in a famine, she had a son and she was about to die. If you're about to die and you know it, if you weren't a praying man or woman, you will. She was praying. And I believe there's other inferences here that show us that this woman was praying for sure. She was praying for the end of the famine. Day passed after day, week after week, and nothing happened until one day at her door, she heard a knock and she came to the door and it was Elijah, God's prophet. She had to be filled with joy and excitement, thinking, well, God has answered my prayer. But you know what Elijah does? He comes into the widow's house, and he goes, hey, there's a famine out here, and I'm hungry, so I need you to feed me. Rude, Elijah, rude, so rude. And the woman says to Elijah, Honestly, before God, I only have enough food for myself and my son, and we're saving it, and that is our last meal before we die. And he just looks at her cold, and he goes, well, give it to me. Feed me. Y'all, that's supposed to be a little funny. It's a little cold of Elijah, really. It's like, whoa. 
But he literally tells the woman, I want you to feed me the last that you have. Feed me. Hear me. The woman had been praying for the end of the famine. And instead, God sends her a hungry prophet. The Bible's alive. You should read it sometime. Praying for the end of the famine, praying for the rain to come, and instead God sends her a prophet who is hungry and he devours every morsel that she has left right in front of her. The woman was a bold woman of faith to actually give it to him. I'd have been like, I don't know. She had to watch hope dwindle. But after he had consumed all that she had, he turned to her and said, you will always have more than enough. God will supply your every need. You will live and you will not die. You will persevere. You will never run out of oil. You'll never run out of flour. As long as you keep, as long as you keep going, God will keep providing. God has answered your prayer. He has met your need in a way that you overlooked. It came, her prayer was answered just in a way she did not expect. And could it be that you have overlooked God's answer to prayer in your life because it came in a way you did not expect. But is he not faithful? Is he not wonderful? Is he not worthy? David said, I've grown from young to old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. You may be the person in here complaining, God doesn't answer me. God doesn't hear me, but you're here today. You are here today. You are alive today. You are well. You have everything you need. He has supplied your every need according to your riches and glory. He may not have answered your prayer when you wanted him to, how you wanted him to, but he is faithful. He is a great and mighty God. Can I share one more thought with you real quick before we close? No one responded, so I'm going to do it. You guys remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? The three servants of God who refused to bow. Nebuchadnezzar fired up the furnace seven times hotter. And he told his guards to arrest these three boys and throw them into the fire. Listen to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. They said this to Nebuchadnezzar. We will not bow because God will deliver us in that furnace. And then they said, but even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, he's still worthy. He's still God and we will not bow. I pray every one of you comes to the place in your life where you pray prayers and you say, he will, he is able, but even if he doesn't, he's still worthy. He's still deserving of my praise. He's still healer. He's still able. There's something beautiful about a heart like that. And you know what happened? He threw them in and the Lord delivered them. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this morning, we all confess to you that we are sinners who have fallen short of your glory. Forgive us, God. Have mercy on us for the times we've abandoned you, ignored you, neglected you, and lived for ourselves. God, forgive us for the times we've been consumers and we've not treated your house like a house of prayer. We've not talked to you in, in weeks, years, days, months. God, forgive us for neglecting the greatest gift earth could ever provide and that's a relationship with you today God we confess our sin we believe that Jesus Christ died on a rugged cross was buried and three days later was resurrected from the dead we believe that he reigns in victory and in power at the right hand of the father Fa father fill us with your holy spirit help us to be bold zealous witnesses of you in the earth and Lord help us to desire a prayer life help us to hu hunger and thirst for righteousness for we will see God and be filled. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Why don't you